cool and retain corium in the calendria vessel with adequate safety margins. He demonstrated that currently operating water cooled reactors can have enhanced safety margins if operated with non fluids, nano fluids, suppression of flow instabilities, and reduction of condensation induced water hammer are brightest examples of his innovations. Under his leadership, ERC has built a 20 kilowatt solar thermal plant with superheated steam production of 225 degrees centigrade. He was actively involved in development of an innovative small modular reactor, which is inherently safe, passive by design, factory built and shipped to site for direct installation and have the potential to build them in vacated sites of coal based thermal power plants. He has been actively involved with HPNI for teaching and guiding him and tech and PhD students he is Associate Editor of ASME Journal of Nuclear Engineering and Radiation Science and Journal of Computational Thermal Science. He is recipient of several awards, which include the Homi Baba Science and Technology Award, BAE uh, Scientific and Technical Excellence Award, BAE Scientific Research Council Outstanding Investigation Award, appropriate awards for scientific and technical excellence. He has written four books and published more than 500 research papers in academic journals and conferences. He is at present the head of Nuclear Controls and Planning in Department of Atomic Energy and Senior Professor, Omi Baba National Institute. He is a Fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineers, Engineering and Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. So, I welcome Dr. Naik and if I understand, I think Dr. Naik will confirm. First, he will deliver his speech and after his speech is over, we will have an interactive uh, question and answer session. Am I correct? So may I now invite Dr. Nayak to deliver his speech. Thank you. One or two names, all of you are real veterans, you are five years of nuclear energy here. What I'm going to speak here is an emotional study. I don't say it is more scientific, but I will speak here. Why emotional? That I will you realize what time frame we have and what we have to do. That is one part. Second and most important part, let me tell you that what I'm going to speak here, please don't misunderstand that it is a DA policy today. Because I'm from a DA nuclear control planning only. Please don't misunderstand today it is the DA policy. But it is a scientific forum I'm sharing here. So this is my request to all of you that please don't make it somewhere that this is Dr. Nayak who spoke in this forum being the head of nuclear control and planning wing. So that is assumed to be the DA policy. So far it has not become the DA policy to go ahead with a small modular reactor program. It may take its own time. But what I'm going to speak here is my own perception and sharing with the thought process around the world how SMRs are relevant and how important it is to deploy and what time frame all of us are. So first let me show you what is the current energy scenario in India in terms of the total primary energy supply, TPS what we say. Why I am showing here this thing, the first 50% of my lecture will be how relevant is this SMR. Then since a lot of nuclear engineers are here, I'll show you one of the technologies that uh, we have worked it out before I moved to BOE. 
And the third part which I'll speak out at the uh, last part, that how it can be deployed in the vacated full size of India. The TPS, if you look at here, today our total primary energy supply is around 880 million tons of oil product. Please remember this number, 880 million tons of oil product. And primarily they come from coal, which is 34%, oil is 25%, gas is 6%, biomass is 13%, renewables and others are very small, you can say negligible. So that is why it is mostly carbon dominated energy system. The health of the nation, why you bother about uh, this uh, resources? So the health of the nation with regard to the economy is dependent on what fraction of the energy resource we import or what we have. What we have is what God has given us and what we import that only drives our economy or health of the nation. If you look at coal, we have two third we have what nature has given us, one third we still import. Oil is just the reverse. Two-third we import, one-third we have. Bioenergy completely we have. And natural gas almost 50-50%. 50% we import and 50% we have. And as you know from the past law of thermodynamics, <coughs> after we burn this fuel, the usable form is from 880 million tons of oil equivalent close to 600 million tons of oil equivalent energy is available. And who are the drivers or consumers of the environment? The today industry is the biggest consumer, roughly 240 million tons of oil equivalent they consume. I'm talking in Indian sector, which is roughly 40% of the total energy. The residential sector is around 180 million tons of oil equivalent, roughly 30%. Transport is 17%, service sector is 13%. And while well, the last top graph, if you see, we are almost the third largest energy consumer in the world, after, after, uh, sorry, after China and America. But most importantly, it's our total population, which is roughly 1.4 billion population. So the per capita energy consumption is very small, 1 to 0 <coughs> kilowatt hour. If we just compare with our neighbors, for example, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, China, it's roughly 3 to 4 times more. Even the world average is roughly 3 times what we consume. And wasted countries almost 6 to 7 times. And that's probably one of the reasons why we place is our XDI is very small as compared to the developed nations, which is about 0.9. And there is a lot of thrust to increase the energy share in terms of per capita. So then we reach somewhere about 0.9. <coughs> what is our energy demand in the near future for India? We know our policy body, the Niti Aayog, Today it is says that India houses nearly 10 crore population without access to electricity. And believe it or not, almost 84 crore of people without access to cleaning cooking fuels. Of course, our total electricity installed capacity has grown from 169 gigawatt to roughly 377 gigawatt in the last 10 years almost growth rate of 8.4 years per year. And this is primarily driven by our own economic growth. You know, the last several years we are growing almost at a similar rate, almost 8 to 8.5%. Our biggest problem is the population. We are growing population. Today we have 1.4 billion population which houses in India. And in the next 30 years, under 30 crore people are going to join us amongst another 30 crore people. So our population is ambitious to be around 1.7 billion, which is going to be one of the largest in the world. 
and uh, India will soon become the world's pop most populous country. And this population will like to cause another 25% energy demand by 2040. And to meet this electricity demand the next 20 years, we have to build the size of a power system of the <coughs> European Union, what they have today. Please remember, to meet this energy demand, we have to build a power system of Europe, what it is there today. And India's urbanization is expected to grow from 31% in 2012 to roughly 50% by the middle of this century. And we all know the GDP is also expected to grow by 8.5% between 2012 to 2047. And also, to meet this energy sorry, development, the manufacturing sector will be also demanding large amount of energy to 34% by mid of the century from 16% which is there in 2012. We have very ambitious plan in energy sector, provide continuous uninterrupted power supply to every household, housing for all, creation of smart cities, 10% reduction of oil and gas import dependency by 2022, which has already happened. And most people are to everyone. And the last two bullets is very sensitive. In the United States, more than 80% people have gone by flights. But in India, it is only hardly 10 to 15%. Lot of Indians in future are going to use flights. At the household level, many Indians do not have appliances such as washing machines, refrigerators, air conditioners, and they are going to grow very significantly in the next few years. And this is what uh, is very, very important graph. If you look at it, I am saying that per capita energy consumption, not with regard to electricity, but total energy consumption divided by total population, we are somewhere here. The Chinese are four times more than us. And the uh, rest of all, which are I'm not showing here, many other countries, which are so-called developed countries, some are 11 times, 15 times, 22 times. Okay, please remember, even our neighbor is almost four times more energy consumed total energy consumption, they consume as compared to us. So, how much energy will require by 2050? It's a big question. And it is an unsolved question today. What I have done? I have just plotted the total energy consumption of the nation, which includes everything. The industry, the domestic sector, infrastructure, everything. In the last uh, 15 years, from 2005 to 2020, is a straight line. And today we are just below 10,000 terawatt hour per year. Assuming our GDP growing at 8.5% per year, by mid of the century we will require 20,000 terawatt hour per year, two times of today. And the previous slide I showed, even that number is very small. Because if you look at China, they consume four times of what energy we consume today. And other countries, 15 times, 20 times, I'm sure. And probably this 20,000 terawatt hour per year may not take you to a developed country like that of the United States or the Western countries. And some of the policy makers say that we should have something like four to five times of the total energy consumption today. That will be something like close to 45 to 50,000 terawatt hour per year. How much? 45 to 50,000 terawatt hour per year. But even with 10,000 terawatt hour per year, the bell has already dropped for the greenhouse gas. There is the biggest worry is the global warming. And this is mainly because of burning of carbon-based fuels, which include the coal, oil, and gas. CO2 is the 
mainly coming from burning fossil fuel. The other things with nitrogen based oxides, methane, chlorinated gases, all are the root cause of the greenhouse gases today. And in the last 30 years, the CO2 emissions has increased from below 40 terawatt hour per year. Today it is something like, sorry, 30 megaton CO2 per year. And today we emit something like 60 gigaton CO2 per year. Please remember this number. Today, globally, the number is 60 gigaton CO2 per year. And we are the third in the world, apart from China and America. China emits something like 10 billion tons CO2 per year. The United States close to 5 to 6 billion tons per year and we roughly 2.3, 2.4 billion tons per year with a total energy consumption below 10,000 terawatt hour per year. If we go to 40,000, 50,000 terawatt per year with the conventional energy sources, this number is going to exceed or come close to China also. This is a very fantastic graph, which I show it in many places. I'm also showing it again here. This is the Nobel Prize uh, paper from the Japanese professor Shikuro Manabe, who received the Nobel Prize in 2021 last year for his work that how much the global the Earth's temperature will rise as a function of the CO2 concentration. He did it, this work in 1960s, but nobody was believing this work is correct. Why? Over the years, the scientists believe the root cause of global warming is not CO2, it is mainly because of water vapor. And those days, he did not have so much advanced computational tools. Using very simple computational tools, he could predict that if the temperature, if the CO2 in the uh, atmosphere increases by two times, it's a double. The temperature of the surface increases by 2.36 degrees Celsius and the vice versa. You take down by half, the CO2 if it reduces by half, the temperature also reduces by 2.28 degrees Celsius. The simple number which all of us can remember if the CO2 concentration increases by two times, the Earth's temperature will rise by two degrees Celsius and vice versa. If take down the CO2 by two times, Earth's temperature will also reduce by two degrees Celsius. So many scientists do not believe what he has spoken is correct. It took almost I have said, 60 years to realize what he has spoken is correct because it was predicted through many, I would say that, advanced computational tools, including CFD, that what he has predicted is correct. That's why he got the Nobel Prize only last year for such a wonderful work. And how much CO2 has increased? Let's look at it. From the pre-industrial level, and today we are 2020, the, in the, the CO2 concentration has increased almost by 50 percent, okay? There is a big question. Why this 2 degrees Celsius? Every time we speak about 2 degree, 2 degree, 2 degree. Who has spoken this 2 degrees Celsius? And why should we bother about this 2 degrees Celsius? The 2 degrees Celsius was a nurse by a group of German scientists who were the advisors to the former environmental minister of Germany. And the number they spoke it is very simple that if you stay below 2 degrees Celsius, the earth will survive. In the sense that looking at how much the sea level is going to rise, how much the flora and fauna can survive, looking at that, they could speak it out. But many scientists also grumbled on the 2 degrees Celsius. They said, 2 degrees Celsius, why? And very simple answer, there's a beautiful paper on this why 2 degrees Celsius. I really love to read that. I'm just saying, 
the example which these people gave to the to the uh, minister. For example, our temperature, body temperature, the healthy body temperature is 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. If it rises by one degree, it is a fever, but it is still tolerable. But if it rises by two degree, the moment we say 100, we say no, no more. Okay? Very simple number. Two degrees Celsius, anything, if it exceeds, most of the animals, the crops, they will also unable to bear it up. And after many years, by 2009, nearly every government in the world agreed that two degrees Celsius has to be respected. This is an uh, analysis by the International Panel for Climate Change in the 2021 report. What they have said that if the temperature rises by 1.4 degrees Celsius or increases to 4.4 degrees Celsius, which is basically three times more, then what happens? If you look at the precipitation, that is the rainfall, it increases by 3.5 times. The sea level rise two times. And if you look at the most important, how much ice is going to melt is about eight times. Believe it or not, the amount of CO2 which is housed in the environment, much more is housed below the Arctic Sea. And once this ice melts, you don't have to burn carbon to make CO2. This CO2 will automatically come up and it's going to be on the condition. Now, how much CO2 budget the global is having and what time duration you have? It's a very important question, a very pertinent question. As I said in my previous slide, globally today, we emit how much CO2? 60 gigaton CO2 per year. If we want to limit the Earth's temperature to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, the CO2 budget we have is 400 to 500 gigatons. How much? 400 to 500 gigatons. And if I divide this by 60, how many years we have? It's only 8 years left if we want to go to least 1.5 degrees Celsius. If we want to go to a limit to 2 degrees Celsius, then the CO2 budget that we have is something like 1150 to 1350 gigatons. And if I divide that by 60, it's roughly 20 years left. So we are only left with 20 years to reach this 2 degrees Celsius. I don't personally believe when net zero who is committing when. I believe if on to limit 2 degrees Celsius, the globe is having only 20 years left. So time to act today. I'm sorry. There are many models which the IPCC has tried that when to break, and if you break today, when you will land at 2 degrees Celsius, 1.5 degrees Celsius, or at 4.5 degrees Celsius, okay? So please take one number today. If you don't break today, we have left with only 20 years to reach the 2 degrees Celsius, and if we limit, cross the limit of 2 degrees Celsius, Probably this heart will be extinct in the sense most of our children will not see. What is the CO2 emission targets by IEA, the International Energy Analysis, what they say? It is basically a 2017 calculations. To produce one unit of electricity, kilowatt hour, how much grams of CO2 is emitted? United States today emits roughly half a kg to produce one unit of electricity. Probably most of us don't know that we consume so much electricity, how much CO2 is emitted behind it. So United States emit half a kg of CO2 to produce one unit of electricity. China, 680 grams. United Kingdom, 350 grams. France, which consume mostly, produce mostly electricity through nuclear, is only 90 grams. 
the IEA recommends if you want the 2 degree Celsius limit, it has to be not more than 11 grams of CO2 per 1 unit of electricity. How much? Only 11 grams of CO2. You it just arrest uh, it. Today, half a kg, for example, America is emitting to produce uh, one <coughs> unit of electricity. It has to reduce by 50 times roughly. And that is the number for everyone except China, that will be because it is rising in population. India is, I did not show the number here, the India's number is still higher as compared to even also China. I have not shown that number. What MIT says? MIT says 11 grams CO2 per one unit of electricity is not sufficient if one to keep this earth surviving. It has to be one gram CO2 if one, one unit of electricity, which is unreal, I'd say, impossible target. But the MIT says deep decarbonization is the need of the hour. And to have that, one unit of electricity, the limit for CO2 is only one gram. It's a very difficult target, impossible target. And we all know. My friend also spoke here sometime back. We have also committed in the COP26 that India will reach its non-fossil energy capacity of 500 gigawatt by 2030. This is Panchamrut. India will meet 50% of its energy requirements from renewable energy by 2030. India will reduce the total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tons from now onwards till 2030. By 2030, India will reduce the carbon intensity of its economy by less than 45%. By the year 2070, will become net zero. That's what I said. I don't know when will become net zero. When India will become net zero, China will become net zero, America will become net zero, I don't know. But if the IPCC calculations are correct, we have only two degrees left. What do we mean by net zero? Net zero is like a tap like this. Believe that this is your atmosphere and whatever greenhouse gases you pump it, you have to remove it so that there is no net accumulation. So that is the meaning of net zero. And to accomplish net zero, what IA has recommended for India, please remember these numbers. The International Energy Analysis, IEA, this recommend that you have to produce 520 million tons of low carbon hydrogen for transport and industry. How much? 520 million tons of low carbon hydrogen. First of all. Second, 85% buildings today, whatever we consume the energy from electricity or from LPG, they have to be zero carbon in the sense. They all have to be run by electricity and the electricity has to be produced from green sources or clean sources, not from carbon sources. Third, 70% of the electricity globally has to be from renewables, solar, PV and wind. Fourth, renewables for India have to be 90% of the total electricity generation. Next, 90% of the heavy industries have to consume low carbon energy. Last 7.6 gigaton CO2 India has to capture if it has to enter into net zero. What is the cost of entering net zero? Look, this is a very, very challenging and most difficult task for India if the previous recommendations are correct. 520 million tons of low carbon hydrogen production. Today, to produce one, uh, I'll say that one kg of uh, hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen, 
that is the international target one dollar one kg this is the target dream which is not possible today even i talked to one mit professor it is a dream but today it's two to three dollars a kg but we have just taken 100 rupees one kg assuming that is the target so 520 million tons will cost us 520 billion dollars almost 520 billion dollars we want to produce 520 million dollar million tons of low carbon hydrogen transport similarly i've just uh, converted everything approximate transport energy requirement for 3750 terawatt hour 235 billion dollars i'm shown and whatever the ia has recommended if i calculate everything it comes roughly 3 trillion dollar is the investment required if all this how much almost the india's gdp has to go whatever we are dreaming today that will be a trillion dollar economy has to be pumped in here if you are interested in that or I just not question so this is a i'll say challenge but this is the business opportunity for you both are there the challenge is there but money will come but also there is a business of both of these are and if i don't do for example i don't want to have I will ride the cycle the way I want. This freedom also I have. What are the other, uh, I'll say that communities have predicted for us? If no action is taken, the climate action tracker has predicted that because of the climate risk, India will be losing 7.14 lakh crores of rupees per year. 7 lakh crores of rupees just to fight against the climate change in are using per year. This is one part. Even the Standard Chartered Bank has predicted much, much more. 22 lakh crores will be losing per year because of the losses, which we otherwise would not be able to do it, the export losses. And if we do it, we have something in the opportunity 3 lakh crores. And if I add everything, you will sell some 30, 35 lakhs crores of rupees we are going to save for India if we do, if we go for net zero other days for sure. What are the energy options for India? Every time we have been speaking, the ministry speaks about new and renewable energy sources. Nuclear is least spoken. And look at what new and renewable energy sources ministry is, I'll say that, I don't use the word speculate, but they have projected for India. The MNRE says, solar potential of the country is around 1640 terawatt hour per year, assuming 3% of the wasteland is covered by solar PV, almost 1640. Niti Ayak says it is not 1,640, it's almost 2,040 terawatt hour per year. Professor Sukhathkar did a lot of calculations few years back. And what he says, if you cover 5%, 10%, 15% of our barren land with solar PV, then max to max we can get something like 3,285 terawatt hour per year. Assuming that this is my assumption by 2050, storage technology is fully developed and deployed. There are no plant outages, other losses are minimum, and 10% barren land is utilized to be covered by solar PV. Max to max, we can get only 2000 terawatt of per year. So I added solar, wind, hydro, bio. This is again from MNRE, all these reports, except solar, I put my number. So, max to max, we can get 4,000 terawatt hour per year. Today, how much we consume? Close to 10,000 terawatt per hour per year. The dream of 20,000, 40,000, 50,000, let's keep it outside. 
only to meet 10,000 terawatt per year, the renewables have only the capacity of 4,000. What about the balance, 6,000? If I have to go to net zero, to meet today's energy demand, there is a balance of 6,000 terawatt per year. And if I convert it to energy system like nuclear, with a very high plant load factor of 90%, this comes to 750 to 800 gigawatt electric. How much? 750 to 800 gigawatt electric. And today we produce only 7 gigawatt electric. So 7 to 750, 800, even to meet today's energy demand. I am not dreaming, I will have India like Europe. If I have to have India like today, which no carbon sources of energy, I need a balance of this much from nuclear. There is no other source. And most important, the coal will be laying off, as I have been saying. This is my projected uh, how the coal plants are, are going to be laying off or retiring because the design life is over and government of India will not allow them to continue beyond the design life because we all have to have clean energy sources. So by 2050, my estimate is that almost all coal plants have to be retired. So 220 gigawatt electric today, which is the basically the driver of electricity supply for India, will be almost off the grid by mid of this century. Okay. The right side, the United States of America, smartly what it has done. It has assessed 400 coal sites of America and they found that this has the potential to replace by 250 gigawatt nuclear. Why I said our coal plants are retiring, examples are here. Today itself, almost 9 gigawatt, today itself is off the grid. And if you look at the year-wise capacity addition of coal with their sizes, mostly they are small, below 300 megawatt. Very recently, the size of the coal plants <coughs> have increased, but largely they are small size coal plants. And where they are located in India? They are located wherever the coal is available. The coal mines, wherever they are available, the coal plants are there. Coal based thermal power plant, mostly in the central part of India and also quite a number in the, I would say that, eastern part of India. If you look at the right, <coughs> fortunately, most of the coal plants are located in zone 2 with regard to the aspects. Most of the coal plants are located in zone 2 and a few are in zone 3. So if you want to replace the coal plants by nuclear, there is a very big advantage with regard to looking at the seismicity. So the biggest cost in I put, the 220 gigawatt electric coal-based thermal power plants will be retired. What is going to replace by mid of this century? Let's look at our own nuclear power program. Where are we and what we target to be in 2050? Today we have all know 22 reactors operating, seven, close to 7 gigawatt, 7,000 megawatt electricity they produce. Under construction, 9 more units. Projects approved, 12 units. So by 2031, assuming everything is in place, so we target something like 33 units, that is 22 gigawatt, and 2 billion dollars, uh, 320 giga, mega, uh, sorry, megawatt electric, and 6 DVRs, which is coming 6,000 megawatt electric, and assuming the PABR is also operational, another 500 megawatt electric, and this dream, if it continues, everything is in place, including ASWR1 is coming, by mid of the century, we can make 66 units, very ambitious, and 50 gigawatt electric. 
It's also an ambitious number, and most of the official people who must be yearly, they also feel that it's a very ambitious target. That mid of the century will be producing 50,000 megawatt electric from nuclear. If I convert that to terawatt hour, it's only 400 terawatt hour per year. How much? 400. How much I require? 6,000. If I don't make this 400, what happens? Nothing. I can forget. I need 6,000. My plate is very big. I don't need one somerset to fill my stomach. I need 6,000 terawatt hour to meet today's energy demand. I'm not talking about 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. Because if this is the biggest challenge for India, how to accomplish such a big nuclear energy demand in such a small time. So this is what I said, even though it is achieved, it's still a very small number. And to achieve that is also a very big challenge. In the last 70 years we have built only 22 reactors. And in the next 30 years to build so many reactors to have 50 gigawatt itself is a big challenge. So, what is the problem? This is what I have analyzed in the next few slides. Most important for India is a small country. And population is 130 crore today. Another 30 crore waiting to join us. 170 crore people in a small boat we are traveling. Population density to look at. We are the largest population based country in the world. Okay? And where will we get the site to build a nuclear power plant? The current ALB course and guide says if I build one nuclear power plant, I need one kilometer exclusion view. 16 kilometer emergency planning zone, 30 kilometer another zone, 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 zone. Okay? Our country is small, lot of population. Why do we get so many sites to build large size plants? Itself is a big question for this nation. And this is the MIT study. With the large reactors, of course, when I am saying that large reactors, I'm not saying that they should be stopped. Large reactors have to move because one reactor is producing 1,000 megawatt, 1,500 megawatt. But what is the constraint that I'm just putting here? The MIT study says that with large reactors, the project cost is very large. For example, one AP thousand today cost 30,000 30, crores. It is huge money you have to put it. And the construction time is 10 years, or maybe sometimes more. So the large investment itself is a big question. When I start getting the return is another big question. If I have the investor, which I have 30,000 crore, I look for whether to put in a nuclear power plant or build some 10 uh, towers and start earning money earlier. So that is the measure, is it? Globally, not only with India. Issue with the large plants. Second, most important, safety of the current reactors, even though excellent, but still three accidents are happened. Okay? So, core melt accident is a bad test in the design. Even though I, am, I have done half of my life in doing research how to manage corium, core melt accident, but itself is a bad case so far, public is concerned. Nobody likes the word, a reactor has melted down, you have to evacuate, leave your house and belongings go to another place. Whether it's a nuclear accident, it's a tsunami, or it's a cyclone, <coughs> nobody likes to move away. So this is something, a moderation, to accept the nuclear power today. So, can SMR be a solution? This is a question. 
was the last reactor had its own iron case. But then there are issues. We need a huge power in this small time frame. It's supposed to can the small modular reactor be a solution? The small modular reactors, as for the IEA definition, we all know their size reactor is small, less than 300 megawatt electric. And target to produce large amount of low carbon electricity. Their base load driver for electricity supply on the grid is primarily supplied by green energy in place of coal, load follower, hydrogen production, desalination, district heating, electricity supply to remote lo locations, defense applications, load of applications there. Today, the IEA targets SMRs to the drivers. Small because the size of the reactor is small. Size, I'm not talking about size of the plant, but the power of the reactor is small. Modular, because the things are built in module, are catered to be a factory assembled reactor mm -hmm. and transported by road for direct installation in a site, thus reducing significantly the site work. Reactors we all know. And small is really not new. In fact, I think uh, all of us know very well, especially I have seen this presentation from AMSA. Initially, globally, reactors which were made, they were really small. Later on, these large reactors were happened because of the economies of scale. Otherwise, to start with the nuclear industry started with the small reactors for defense applications, strategic applications, before the civilian applications started. What are the technologies the SMRs are to be targeting? I have just classified them into few categories. One is for near-term deployment. Another is for long-term deployment. And there are many variants of SMRs. The IEA says 70 plus designs are floating all over the world. And the near-term deployment is mostly with the water cool technologies. Why? Because these are mature technologies. The technology is more than six decades old. And the manufacturing technology is well known, established. Materials are all proven, a rich operating experience worldwide, design, life, safety, everything is proven, licensing criteria is well established. So that is why these water cooled reactors, best SMRs, can be considered for immediate or near term deployment. But the high temperature reactors, like molten salt reactors, gas cooled reactors, a lot of things have to happen. So these are considered for the long-term development. Amongst the water cool technologies, there are two variants. One is called the block type SMR, another is called the integral type SMR. In the block type SMR, it's like a conventional pillow floor. The reactor pressure vessel is here at the center. The steam generator, pressurizer, pumps are directly welded like blocks on the pressure vessel. In the integral pit of blur, all these external things are pushed into the pressure vessel like one unit. Okay? Like we buy a refrigerator from the shop. So the steam generator, the reactor core, the steam generator, the pump, and the pressurizer, everything inside the vessel. So this is called integral. The integral reactor, SMR, has its own inherent advantages. There are disadvantages also because no technology is completely advantageous. This is the law of nature. To gain something, you have to lose also something. Advantage is that because everything is inside the pressure vessel, the safety is definitely scores. There is no question of a large break local because there is no, there is no pipes involved in that. This can be fabricated as a single unit because inside the pressure vessel, the steam generator is 
the full nuclear spin supply system is inside the pressure vessel. So if you manufacture the pressure vessel with everything inside, it comes as a single unit. You just buy it from the shop and put it for a direct installation. So site work is minimum, construction delays are the smallest. Disadvantage. Housing all the components inside the pressure vessel is a challenge. Today, this is a real challenge. I think in my, I just discussed with the friends uh, uh, EDF. They say that there are submarines, nuclear submarines. Some of the submarines have this type of features. I don't know about America, but the French claim that some of the submarines have this type of features. And difficulties, another difficulty in service inspection, how to open it and see that which steam generator tube has failed. So ORDM is also another problem with the integral type. I will show you if in a few slides, the integral type SMR, some of the countries which are about to deploy or in the advanced stage of deployment. The most one is called the New Sail, which the Americans are doing, is also an integral type SMR. All the components is inside the single pressure vessel, it's complete passive, no pump, operates by thermosiphon in a reactor at PWR operating condition. Normal PWR operating pressure temperature condition, including the fuel geometry of that of the wasting house, is retained. The fuel burn-up enrichment is closer to that of a wasting house PWR. The next is the newer, which is the French uh, European consortium is making. It is also an integral field of work. Fortunately, I am a board member of this, so I have a lot of access to what they are doing here. So here, if you see, it is also an integral field of work. Two units are housed in a single containment. So each one is 170 megawatt electric. The previous is The previous one, new scale, is a 77 megawatt electric plant, almost 77. And uh, this one, each one is roughly 160 to 170 megawatt each reactor. And operating pressure, temperature, fuel, everything is typical to that of a PWR condition, including the enrichment of the fuel. Next is the Russian one, RITM 200. Is yet to be deployed on the land, but it is also targeted as an integral field of work, targeted for the uh, submarine application. It is also an integral one, except that the pumps are outside. The French is also pump circulation. In this case, this is also pump circulation. And here, the enrichment targets are higher. Why? Because of the application in submarine. The next is called the SMR-160, which is the Holtec International United States of America. This is not exactly an integral reactor. This is the reactor pressure vessel, which houses also the pressurizer. The steam generator is directly welded to this one. But it is a natural circulation system. It looks very good. The power is relatively higher, but the size of the reactor is very big, almost 70 meters for such a uh, small size of the reactor. But the fuel, its composition, burn-up, enrichment is closer to that of wasting house type pyrofer. Next is the UK's SMR Rolls-Royce, which is also the top of the town. It's no different from that of a bit of work. We can say it's a mini bit of work, 300 megawatt hours side reactor. Otherwise, there's no difference. It's, we cannot say it is an SMR. It's not an SMR, really. It's a small reactor, small bit of work. It's also a reactor pressure vessel, 
the steam generator, the pump, everything you added to this is 300 megawatt conventional pedicular, but they push it into the SMR group. Then I have just compared the features of this integral pedoclars, new scale carom is the Argentinian one, acid 100 with the size one, which is the advanced stage of deployment, smart is the Korean one, okay. And if you look at the power of that, the new scale is, as I said, 77, carom, which is a, a technology demonstrator, is a 30 megawatt electric plant. SCP 100 is 125 megawatt electric plant. Smart is also 107 megawatt electric plant. Primary side pressure temperature is same as a pedometer pressure temperature, slightly off the secondary side. The reactor pressure vessel diameter is roughly 3 meter if you look at, except the Korean one is a bigger diameter. Height is, new skill is quite big, why they want from our natural circulation. If you go from pump circulation, the height becomes half almost. Temperatures are close to that of the conventional PWR temperature, inlet outlet temperature, fuel pin for assembly, everything they put a standard PWR design scaled down to that of the SMR. So there is no more research with regard to the reactor. And why they have done it? Let me, before we, I go to this one. <coughs> they have not done it very, very carefully because when they go to the regulator, they don't want that the regulator has to delay the licensing process because you have come, out, come, come with a, a different fuel design which has its different burn up or different enrichment or different clad material and for which there is no operational experience. That is the purpose for this near-term deployment of this type of system, very carefully they have done, so that in the next 10 years, these are flooded in the market. And uh, apart from this, all these reactors, especially the new scale one, is fully passive, not only for decay heat removal or accident conditions, even for injection of coolant, in case there is a loss of coolant accident occurs, <coughs> And containment in almost all SMRs is metal. Why metal? Because the size of the containment in this reactor is very small. So it can be prefabricated in the plant, in the, uh, I would say that, with the manufacturer. With minimum work, it can be put in the site. So like in a concrete containment, which the NPCL people agree, if you go for a concrete containment, it takes several years to build a containment. In case of metal containment, in few months you can finish the containment installation. So most important here, how SMRs address the issue of enhanced safety, most important. They are targeted, they don't require any emergency planning job. The 16 kilometer radius zoning requirement, which conventional reactors look for, is really patterned with the SMR. How? In the SMRs, the size of reactor is small. Radioactive inventory is small. So, release at part boundary never exceeds the allowable dose limit. What is that? I am going to speak next. Under any circumstances during the plant operation or even at shutdown conditions, so that there is no emergency planning or evacuation in the public road. Many of these SMRs are tied up with tag. There's a trademark, walk away safe reactor. In the sense, if any accident occurs, the operator can go to his house, take care of his family, leaving the reactor on its own it can be safely managing without any action required at the emergency for the public. Why we say this can be early inducted? I have spoken, but I put the words here. As I said, the water cooled reactor technology is old, more than six decades old, lot of experience exists today. Passive systems are well known. 
especially for India, for ASWR, almost three decades of experience exist. We have built hundreds of facilities for passive systems. So these technologies can be easily adopted without much investment in research. How they look right? Why they can multiply so early? This is an integral SMR and this is a conventional <laughs> reactor. In the integral SMR, this is to the scale. Huh? I'm not just putting a number here. This is to the scale of an integral SMR of 100 megawatt electric size. The diameter here is only 3 meter and the height is close to 20 meters. So this whole product, I believe it is a product, single product. This can be manufactured in a factory, put in a truck, and directly it can be unloaded at the site. On the other hand, in a conventional pedocle, the pressure vessel I have to order somewhere, the pump I have to order somewhere, the steam generator I have to order somewhere, the pipes I have to order somewhere, they have to come, integrate at the site. So this is the complexity of a conventional pedocle. So this is a single product. I can build it. 10 products in parallel in 10 places and just uh, take them and install in my site for direct install. So that is the advantage that this can rapidly multiply. Economic advantage. Lesser investment with early returns. A 100 megawatt size reactor, for example, even though it costs 2,500 crore, we say we say 1000 megawatt electric plant, 25,000 crore. A small investment a investor like me will choose to invest 2500 crore if I get the return after two years. Rather than investing 25,000 crore to get the invest, uh, return after 10 years. So in this case, the investment is small and the return is earlier. And most, and most important is the IDC during the construction, the interest during the construction. Because the site work is very small, construction delays are smaller, so the interest during the construction <coughs> is smaller. So investment is small, return is early. So these are its uh, characteristics of the economics. There are plenty of papers on the economics of SMRs. I am not going to speak it out because of time. One I have put it here. The characteristics why the plant cost comes down is because we are ordering many, not one. If I order 1000 megawatt blower, this is I order 10 SMR, output is the small same. But because of the multiple units I am ordering, the price comes down. The economics of number. In the learning curve itself, the first few units, they will definitely order. But once you know how to manufacture, to reduce the cost, that is called the learning curve, then the cost further comes down. Construction schedules definitely the delays are not there. And because of that, what is the US estimate I am just putting? The levelized cost of electricity for a four unit of 150 megawatt electric plant is something like $71 per megawatt hour, which in today's cost, if you say 80 rupees a dollar, will be something like 5 rupees 60 paisa per unit of electricity for the fourth plant, first plant. But if you go for the NF plant, that is after nine units, it will be something like 4 rupees 80 paisa per unit of electricity. And most important, if we are targeting 220 gigawatt electric coal plants to be replaced by SMR with large employment opportunities, as well as making India. So several hundreds of such reactors, if built, will not only boom the Indian manufacturing sector, service industry, but also help in reducing the unemployment. Now the size. Moment we talk about SMR, 
people range from 10 to 300. Am I correct? But what is the size suitable for us? For all the attributes I spoke before. The size of the SMR is selected based on India's domestic manufacturing ability today. Okay. We have the limitation with regard to the size of the inverter, especially. For example, LMT is to less than Tibro is today house is having only the press. Okay. So the inward capacity part they have today is only 210 tons. And after forging, the single component which it weighs is only 60 tons. The Lord, Lord is wasted. And that gives the maximum diameter of the vessel is 5.2 meter, not as a single unit, but as a, as a, as a plate, what they can manufacture is only 5.2 meter. So this gives the maximum vessel body is 4 meter. If I make a reactor pressure vessel, what they can manufacture today is a vessel of 4 meter body and with thickness limited by forging of 60 tons and the most important, the core belt region, no welding is allowed because the fuel is housed there. And in the flange section, the maximum thickness is 900 millimeter height and 550 mm thickness. The final body possible is limited only to 3.8 meter diameter and ID is 3.4 meter. And if what is possible to transport by road in India, the Indian road condition today permits that any structure whose weight is less than 500 tons. So combining all these things, what do we third? That if the reactor pressure vessel diameter is around 3.5 meter diameter and designed to the pressure temperature conditions of the PWR and the height is so selected that only 500 tons the gross weight, that indirectly sizes what could be the size of the reactor for India. It is not 300, it is not 10. There is one size. Okay? That is target one. Target two is the safety aspects. I said the most important of making an SMR is no EPJ criteria, no emergency planning zone criteria. Exclusion zone of one kilometer is a good number because there is a dose criteria there, one millisievert per year. Our AAV friend says any reactor can meet this criteria. It's not a problem, especially for the normal operation. Considering the current actual dose rate, this is satisfied for almost all reactor sizes. EPZ, there is a requirement. That total dose should be below 10 millisievert following the event per year, which is a criteria for food control and restriction and operational intervention level 3. I think my friend Dubey, he has guided me exclusively for this. Then the SMR can be operated without the emergency planning zone criteria. USMRC, very cleverly, I will say the word cleverly, which we are not clever enough, has limited the size of the reactors to be 250 megawatt per month. 250 megawatt per month. Then what will be the output? 77. What is the new scale? That one. Then they say they can relax the EPZ provided this reactor is with all passive systems. Please remember how America drives and where we drive. There's a difference. The Americans very cleverly have said this is a USMS strategy. The reactor power thermal, not electric, is 250 megawatt thermal and is fully passive, then I can relax the EPZ, which is a new scale. Okay? They did not say new scale, they put this at the target. Consider it this. The limiting size of an Indian SMR, considering both safety and what can be manufactured today, is a 300 megawatt thermal or 100 megawatt. Please remember that 
a 220 megawatt electric PS doubler is not an SMR because after speaking so many smiles, SMR means is a factory built assembled road transported reactor with every components inside and the size of the reactor power is limited by this so that there is no emergency in the planning zone if I want to put this SMR as a replacement to the power plant. Please remember this number. What could be the operating condition of this SMR? This is something brainstorming I had done before leaving to DA. I'm just putting it here. So all that we put it here is the same as that of a conventional pillowbird without changing anything. Why? If I change anything here, the regulator is not comfortable. He will demand for all operational experiences. That is why the pressure, temperature, power of course is already defined. <coughs> Primary side, secondary side is closer to that of the operating period. And the fuel assemblies can be very similar to that of the DDM because that is the only period of blur which is operational in India in a power reactor. So we put almost the same design close to that, I don't see one to one, of a linear fuel here, except that the enrichment levels were relatively higher. Okay? Otherwise, the fuel recycle time is almost the same, a little bit different from that of the DDR. I'm just reading it here. The active core height is smaller as compared to that linear is 2.2 meter and it is hexagonal, triangular is the same as linear. Three batch, each batch is 10, 10, 10 for every 450 foot power base. Inventory is 12.69 tons and so on. I am not reading it out. The linear heat rate, the advantage is here, is much smaller than for an operating period of blower. So we have a large safety margins. Then I started comparing with what other SMRs are doing. Suppose we go for this SMR. This is just a canvas. Then what we found with regard to the power, electric, those which are going to immediate deployment, except two, I said, the Holte, as well as uh, the UK best uh, Rolls Royce, rates rest all fall very close to that this design. With regard to the flow preservation, the fuel configuration, the burn up, the fuel enrichment are very close to this. Now, in the process design, what we thought, I just borrowed the idea of the new scale. 250 megawatt thermal, fully passive. If you want to replace a coal plant without any PPG. <coughs> so we started looking at, suppose we make a 100 megawatt electric plant fully passive, what could be the dimensions? So this was size. And believe it or not, the total reactor height was of the order of, I think, uh, close to 15 meters. And uh, from top to bottom, it was almost 20 meters in height. And diameter is 3.5 meters. Yeah, this is how it performed. Also, we put a steel containment here as an integral part of this reactor itself, which houses the reactor. And uh, I also it has some gravity driven water pool like the age of Lord was having, so that in case a small break, if it happens, the water is injected directly to the vessel passively. And there are also isolation condensers for PDHRs, that is passive decay fumes that I'm going to show you. And also it has a passive poison injection system to cater to the, uh, in case the wire shutdown systems fail, and there are some valves. 
this is how the passive poison injection system will work. That in case a malicious act happens in the control room, the terrorist enters and tries to tries to I think affect both the primary shutdown system, the wired shutdown systems. In that case, passively, because of the high pressure in the reactor pressure vessel, the poison can be injected into the reactor pressure vessel and making it shut down. This was a technology which was engineered in AS number, so this can be engineered here. The second part was addressing the Fukushima type of accident. So in case the SBO occurs, what we thought, the decay heat can be removed passively indefinitely if we have an air cooled condenser system here. The steam can be taken and condensed here outside through an air cooling system, both primary second side, secondary side and tertiary side all passive and air is always available. So in indefinitely this reactor can be cooled. In addition to that, what we thought that, that in case of uh, uh, the Fukushima type of accident, because we have steel containment, the containment can be cooled also passively by air indefinitely for having seen it. And uh, as you know, in integral type field of work, it's not possible because everything is housed inside the pressure vessel, there is no position of large break locker. Only small brake loca is possible, which is because of the steam relay valve which stuff opens like PMI, or it's the ECCS line breaks, or the CVCS line break, or the steam generator tube ruptures. And to address that also, we had put some accumulators inside, and they can be injecting water into the pressure vessel passively, so that the core is flooded or rich water, and after that, all that water which comes into the vessel, they comes into the containment and the whole pressure vessel is submerged in the water pool and then whatever heat is removed here is removed by the metallic containment outside. So the reactor is cooled indefinitely, passively, without any core degradation. And what we did here, we assumed <coughs> an extreme conditions of several safety systems failure. Then what we found, if the reactor size is 100 megawatt directly, the max clock temperature is only 750 degrees Celsius. If it is 125 megawatt directly, it can go to 100, 825 degrees Celsius. If it is 150 megawatt directly, it can go to 950 degrees Celsius. So if it is 100 megawatt and below, it is inherently safe. The temperatures are below the number, even no hydrogen is produced. So, this is my beautiful picture. I really love it. Apart from whatever I spoke, to put a plant in a public domain, apart from safety, security is also an important part. For whatever reason, those control instrumentation system fails because of the malicious act in the control room or because of any external event. The full secondary system, the cooling system is unavailable. If we can demonstrate the reactor is safe, then only it can be put in a public domain, otherwise not. And that is the beauty of the SMR with the safety systems I spoke. And these are some of the figures at the long mark. We have drawn it, how it will look at a 100 megawatt electric size pre-roller. These are just figures I'm just showing you here. The internals, yeah, the steam generator, the heavy alcohol steam generators, yeah, the tubes, bundles, a lot of things was done. Even the steam header, field header, the steel containment, this was also done. Even how to, uh, from the top view of the steel containment. Now, the last thing. If I have a 
site of 250 by 250, this is the plan view of the reactor, we can put four of these units, that is, four into 100, 400 megawatt electric can be housed in a site of 250 by 250 meters. Then what do we do? Uh, this is some of its views. So before, before I go to uh, the other one. We did some proliferation resistance study of the SMRs. And this, there is a, this is a very recent paper from a Korean author. They calculated the proliferation resistance of SMAR as one unit. VC, VC, Korean large speed of load. And the SMART is scores well about the field of load, 0.78 versus 0.7. Then if you look at the peer values of SMART, KLT for the Russian field of load, and new scale, with one unit, two units, four units, eight units, and 12 units, they have been compared. If you look at here, as the number of units increase, of course, the amount of plutonium keeps on increasing. And that is why the PR values also increase. But at 12 units, these numbers are very close to that of the last size speed of run. So there is a fear that SMR is more having a proliferation concern is really not correct. Safety and security, this uh, security and safeguard. These two aspects also we looked at very carefully, especially for SMR. So the challenges for licensing and regulatory aspect is, one is very much required, whether we deploy it today or after 10 years, performance demonstration of the passive security. This is target one, this has to be done. And the ARB also will demand to demonstrate practically elimination of all severe failure modes. That is second. And that is linked to reduce or no emergency planning. So these three are the most important thing the regulatory body is going to ask when you go for SMR. Especially with regard to the third party liability on SMR, the CLM issues, civil liability nuclear damage, there are various conventions, we are not party to that. But very recently, there has been a study by OECD countries, I am just putting that one here, that SMRs are included in the definition of nuclear installation provided in the convention, which covers <coughs> reactors other than those comprised in any means of transport. Having regard to the nature of nuclear installation involved, and to the likely consequence of a nuclear incident originating therefrom, the conventions, except for the Vienna Convention, allow countries to establish a low amount of liability for that installation, provided that in no event shall any amount so established be less than the amounts provided in the Convention for low risk installations. The aim of this option is to avoid burning the nuclear operators concerned with unjustified insurance or financial security costs. Therefore, this is what the OEC recommends. SMRs may be considered as low risk installation. So, the CLMD, the civil liability damage, may not be applicable to SMR. Now, next few slides I will be showing how SMRs fit to replace the retired for plant speed. A typical 3,760 megawatt thermal power plant in India, one of the station of NTPC, it occupies 10 kilometers square area without aspen, another 23 kilometers square area with aspen. <coughs> Nuclear plant, I just took our 2 into 530 megawatt PSW which is 1080 megawatt. It occupies 0.8 kilometer square area, including reactor building, turbine building, auxiliary building, and other building. So if we look at the area it occupies, they hardly 0.2 acres per megawatt electric. 
and uh, with three kilometers square exclusive zone, one kilometer of would be take radius, it is 0.686 acres per megawatt. Suppose today the country is not ready to test the Mars and government decides to put that land for solar or wind. It must be. If this land, 23 kilometers square, is utilized for solar, and solar today it requires 7.9 acres per megawatt, mass to mass, 720 megawatt electricity is possible. How much? Only 720 in place of 3,700. And if wind is used that area, depending on the location, it is it requires 10 acres of land per megawatt. So mass to max only 568 megawatt electric per What I did? I put the SMRs in this site. What we found that safely 32 units, that is 8 into 4 units of SMRs, can be put in that site of 3700 megawatt. Together they can produce 3200 megawatt. And in addition to solar EVs, the balance area, they can produce 3930 megawatt in place of 3760 megawatt. Then uh, with NIAS, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, we critically looked at many sites of India, some sites I'm showing here. One is Talcher, Odisha, existing 460 megawatt, which have retired already. The state government doesn't know what to do. NTPC may put another plant there. Yeah. But today, this site is vacant. And if we will put the SMR in that site, we can produce 600 megawatt in place of 460 megawatt. Guru Gobind, you know, thermal power station, existing is 1260, but the site is a huge land. What we found? We can make a SMR park there, almost 14.8 gigawatt, that is 14,800 megawatt is possible in place of 1260 megawatt. Farakata thermal power station, today it produces 2,100 megawatt and SMRs can produce 2,000 megawatt. Even we looked critically the Kathy power plants. Believe it or not, in India today, the captive power plants for steel and aluminum especially, they consume 30% of total electricity. How much? 30%. So, as a case study, we visited Nalco, where they produce aluminum through captive uh, power plant from coal. So, this is the place, and this is the map which they shared with us, suppose. And then we started mapping that. What we found that this land, wherever the captive power plant is located, I think it produced close to 1000 megawatt electric through coal. It can safely produce 1200 megawatt. And there are some population outside also, I think this region, and which possibly because people occupy in near the coal plant. If this population can be removed, it's 2400 megawatt. But safely today, 1200 megawatt can be produced. Next, we visited the Upur Thermal Power Project. This is not a brown site, this is a green site. This is located in Tamil Nadu, just above the Kuran Kulam site. The government of Tamil Nadu <coughs> had given this site to NTPC, if not NTPC, I'm not very sure, to build a thermal power plant 2 into 800 megawatt. Best. But transporting the coal from East India to here was very expensive. So the land could not be used to build any project. So what we thought, this is the basic of the land. We started mapping it for the SMR. This is another SMR park which we could make. The 32 modules can produce 12.8 gigawatt from this side in place of the MBC's 800 megawatt. Then the other side is Kothagoram. And that side, 
today it can produce 5200 megawatt similarly badarpur it can produce 2000 megawatt many sites kota existing 1440 megawatt through smr 3400 megawatt sanjay gandhi thermal power station existing 1340 megawatt with smr can produce 2000 megawatt then Manuguru, also we have captive power plants and they have also retired. At the heavy water plant, the board is putting a lot of uh, solar PV in that place. Initially, I think the Ravaros have nodes, we are trying to put solar thermal there, but it didn't happen. So this also we mapped here. And here also we found uh, this can be replaced by SMRs, the retiring board. What are the selling factors by choosing existing coal sites by for nuclear? Most important land acquisition. Land is available. If you don't convert to nuclear today, maybe the state government will sell this land to somebody else to build a plant uh, or to, sorry, to build a housing complex or to build a mall and it will be lost very soon. Water source. It's already available because like nuclear, in case of coal, they also almost throw 60 to 70 percent of heat into water. So water body is available, site survey is done, transport facility, rail, road, connection, everything is in place. Decommissioning of boiler and turbine may be required, may not be required, depending on the case. Trans town seal for employees is already there. Rather, these employees are trying those which are getting close that re-employ us. Sewage <coughs> treatment plant is a very So this is a huge cost itself. Infrastructure is available, which otherwise one will spend years to build it. Now I have compared. If we use today's supercritical coal, the cost of electricity is something like 5 rupees for the 6 percent. And if government goes with coal, there is a target to put the carbon capture and storage. And with CCS, the price of electricity just goes down. It's too expensive in the CCS technology. So it becomes 11 rupees 16 paisa. Natural gas is very small, 2 rupees 78 paisa. The moment we put, put carbon capture and storage, the price of electricity is 8 rupees 48 paisa. Solar PVs, we all know, and it's subsidized today, 2 rupees 47 paisa. The moment you go for battery storage, it's very expensive, 11 rupees 47 paisa. Wind, 2 rupees 40 paisa. moment you go for battery storage, it's 11 rupees 40 paisa. Nuclear, today, 5 rupees 40 paisa. So apart from electricity, whatever I said, the most important, is the green hydrogen. I said 520 million tons. IEA per class for India is a huge number. And that is required both for transport and heavy industries. And for one megawatt electric, typically 480 kg of hydrogen can be generated per day using standard low temperature electrolysis. And if you go for high temperature steam electrolysis, Almost 630 kg of hydrogen can be produced per megawatt. So SMRs, this is what the Indian oil is today approaching us, that give us two SMRs, exclusive for hydrogen products. Okay. And this is my last slide. One part is energy, other part is water. I have a big lecture on water. I put only one slide here. What I say, the rain god gives only the same amount of water loss. 1950 and 2020, the population has increased several fold, but rain god's water is the constant. And that is what the per capita water availability has sunk exponentially down. And today, what the UN says, we are going to be one of the water's last country. Because by 2050, we will be close to 1,000, this number, okay? 
So SMRs, apart from energy production for electricity, hydrogen and all, also has a very big potential to produce clean drinking water through desalination. Because they have a huge cost, 6,100 kilometers. How much the SMR capacity is envisaged by 2035, just 10 years from now? And this is also from a NAOECD study. So one aspect is so far that probably nobody is going to use this. Because there is one concern. I think those concerns it started before I spoke. The president of INS spoke to few things. That is, who is going to manage the waste? Who is going to give the fuel? And who is going to give the cost? And so on. There are many points. These are called the challenges to SMR propagation. And assuming there is no other way, the world has to move only in one direction. Because sooner or later, globally it will be felt like the language I'm speaking here, there is no time left with us, except to change the gear. In that case, there is a projected emphasis that in 10 years, globally that could be something like 20 gigawatt electric installation from different parts of the world, not only in Asia or Europe or America, including many African nations today are looking for SMRs. So with this, uh, I'm concluding and uh, I'm thanking once again to INS for giving me this slot to speak to this august audience. Thanks a lot, sir. I'm very happy to be here with you. now and uh, if the question answers are too many maybe we can come back after lunch so i now uh, throw the hall open for questions to dr Knight. thank you very much <coughs> Allow me to speak while sitting because I have a problem. Sir, can I uh, just a small request before you pose the question, please identify yourself for the benefit of the audience. Thank you. I'm an SPC, retired from AARP 36 years back. Now I noticed this very impressive presentation. I compared this with the data, published data on the Western SMRs. There's an important difference I see. The Western SMRs do not have any high pressure, which is called cooling. They do not have passive air cool cooling. They have cooling in a pool, like in a magnetic condenser. Now, the question is have they overlooked something or have we overlooked something? Actually, uh, you started a very nice question. I'll just tell you, I'm a board member of the French mm -hmm. SMR. You are. So I have the great privilege, like your board member, you can shoot any question. So last board meeting, I asked the same question to the French SMR. I compared their design to the new scale. I said, new scale is passive, 77 megawatt. What has made you to go for 170 megawatt? They put a tag, no core melt is possible. You are saying, I can manage a core melt. They say that I don't need any PZ because the NRC has relaxed the PZ. You don't have that tag. So what is your, your design object? Let me tell you, I'm sharing with this audience, but then there is also getting recorded, this part I didn't want. But they say, we started, we started in a hurry. Let me speak. 
and we have a standard manufacturing process. That is, our forging is ready for a 5 meter diameter vessel. We didn't want to change that vessel. Okay? So, using the existing forging capacity, what integral pyrogular can be made? So, this became a dark kind of issue. So, it became 160 or 170 megawatt. Moment you go to that size, then many passive systems do not work, especially to meet these objectives. That is why they say that I can manage the core belt because I can put water drop here and there. I cannot pull by air to a language you spoke. So it depends what is the end intention. The French SMR today don't claim I don't need any pigeon. Okay? While the, US, the new scale design says, I don't, I don't need any PJ, while the French uh, design doesn't clear. So there is a difference. So what we thought here, you said that, but please don't think that it is a, uh, this design will be taken up or not, that is secondary. But most important, what struck me, safety is the most important aspect. If we can show by design itself, poor melt is excluded, indefinite cooling is possible. If these two things can happen, this 200 gigawatt electric pole side is in my hand. If that is not possible, unlike the western countries where the coal plants is also away from the city, in the Indian condition, the coal plants are in the heart of the city. The public, they will not get even one kilometer exclusion zone. Public lives even just 300, 400 meters away from that. So, the safety is the most important target <coughs> for Indian This is my answer. The other question I had was the electricity is the design made for those hybrid or the base load? Yeah, yeah, this is the second thing you are spoken. See, coal is today riding the base load, definitely. I think this is what is also our target, <coughs> that in case of coal, we should have something should be at the best floor. And that is the objective of nuclear, not necessarily SMR per se. I don't know why the SMR so many will come to really be a best floor that I don't have the answer to that. But nuclear in the absence of coal has to be the best floor. The fluctuating ones will be the oil that solar and wind, they will be happy. And 30 percent of the total electricity or energy demand has to come from the best flow. It's first. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, I'm Dr. D. Dutta, <coughs> ex enthusiast. See, I had one question uh, regarding this. Uh, <coughs> whatever idea you have of putting this, uh, so many SMRs in existing old sites. Uh, you already have talked very nicely about how uh, you, we will replace the energy part. Uh, another important uh, aspect is uh, once you have so many <coughs> SMRs in the uh, old sites, uh, how, how do you dispose of the waste, nuclear waste? Because this is the nuclear waste management. Uh, uh, the initial management and the final resting sites. So those will require some special attention. So have you given any thought about yeah, Actually, this is the major thing. I think uh, Dr. Jaltabji also started with that. What we thought, this is again my big idea, I mean a dream land, but I'm just telling you. May not be the all coal plants, but probably the good number of coal plants. Suppose I said there are basically solar, uh, sorry, SMR parks, and there will be a large number of possible. Probably it can be calculated how many can be water based, how many can be plutonium, sodium based, or plutonium uranium based. That means the first reactor best SMRs. So probably we can put the reprocessing plant there itself, exclusively looking for that site. So the spent fuel of one becomes the fuel for the next. So again, I am saying this is a, just a thought process. We discussed also with Isaac. They have a certain looking for a design around 100 megawatt electric, almost same characteristics. Whether a sodium cooled uh, uh, sodium cooled SMR 
can be also built to the same site where these water pool SMRs. And then we have the provision of literacy on site. Probably it may be possible, it may not be possible, but this is a thought process. But then as I said sometime before, today also we have to look at 220 gigawatt electric, because I spoke 700, 800 gigawatt electric, nuclear is required. But SMR probably 220 gigawatt only from the coal side you may get, or maybe much higher than 220 number. But still it is not 700, 800. Large reactors also have to go. The reprocessing of the cement spent fuel so much, it's not, today it is only 6, 7 gigawatt we are talking. But imagine 700 gigawatt spent fuel, how to do it? It's simply the big question. I think if asked me today, I have thought of, I have not thought of. It's a big, very big question how to answer that. What is the cost of reprocessing? And if you don't reprocess, how well you store it? What the cost of storage of that? This is something we really have to very critical. If I may, just yeah, the second question is there and that just I finish. And we also have to look because mostly we are going to import this fuel. Yes. So then uh, this will be coming under the regulation, you know? Yes, this and is IAS guards. Same guards. That also has to be. Uh, is uh, looked into when right. we really think about the proposal. Yeah, yeah, it will be all set back. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Can I just ask or maybe comment on this one, Dr. McFair? See, uh, reprocessing is a good idea, but knowing a little bit about what FRFCF is doing, that is for a fast reactor fuel cycle facility, it is not just the reprocessing, you have to do a refabrication also. And then, if you have a mix cycle, like you have uranium cycle, you have plutonium cycle, and suppose uh, indigenously tomorrow you want to put a thorium cycle also. So the reprocessing of these separate schemes will re require separate type of reprocessing plants. So I think those features will also have to be taken into. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. just speaking on the year without me. Uh, can I proceed having mic in the hand? One by one, maybe I think Shri uh, may I am uh, Madhotra, retired from the AE. See, uh, I have the advantage, I have produced many annual reports of the AE and read many more. Okay. So last 30 years, we are hearing about AHWRs. And I think by your description, Maybe with some or without modification, they can qualify as SMRs. Okay? <clears throat> then, so we have heard a lot about AHWRs. Then we have seen the development of compact light water reactor, first land-based such reactor, went critical somewhere, I think about 20, 20, uh, 20 years back. I am talking roughly. 20 years back, yeah. then I heard about CHTR, Compact High Temperature Reactor, maybe about, about 18 years back. Then I heard about new scale, I mean I'm telling on time scale, only about 15 years back. I heard that new scale SMR, that, that, that was the first time 18 years back that I heard the word SMR. And then of course, uh, in Hall 7, my batchmate, Vijayan, he was working on, I think, molten salt reactors. So, I, if I put all this together, actually, we are the pioneers of SMRs. We should be called as pioneers of SMRs. And I want your comment, and now today we are going for importing SMRs. What happens to all this AHW? Why can't we use the land based uh, that whatever has been used for submarine? With, with or without any yeah, modification, yeah, yeah. and AHWR, and CHTR, yeah. and molten salt reactor. Okay. So I, I'll start with the AHWR. AHWR, as you rightly said, is a lovely design because I have given my blood and sweat to this reactor. I have worked probably 30 years on AHWR design. 
but why it cannot be considered as SMR? Let me, I start with that. I was also full, like uh, many others probably. I was one among many from DAU who used to attend IAA SMR meeting. And I used to take the advantage, you know, every time I go to AS to work, and these Western people, they come with these designs. The new skill, the previous name was MASLWR, multi-application small light water reactor. The Western house used to come for similar other design. And they used to come small reactor, all integral, everything inside. <coughs> so uh, in DA, while we used to speak about small reactors, not economy of merit, there used to be, I would say that, comments definitely on a small size, 300 megawatt. India needs thousands of megawatt. Why 300 megawatt? Yes, there is one question used to be there. And at the same time, I myself used to laugh at them. When they come with a design like 50 megawatt, PWR, 100 megawatt, PWR, I said, what is the use of making this small size? This is as a fool, I was also laughing like this. Now, what they could do, which we could not do. Now, this is what is the difference. It is basically a vision. ASWR was the design target post EMI. Post EMI, People were afraid of two things. One thing was that a reactor can melt down. That was the major fear. And melt down because of the operator performance, I would say that. Whether it's intentional, non intentional, whatever. So, new designs post TMI, what has happened is all passive systems came. But without looking at the size of the reactor, size is because it was higher. To get the economy of scale. ASWR was a small size reactor to accommodate almost all passive systems. That was the objective. And thorium was getting bigger. So, objective of ASWR was to actually enough thorium. Are they understand? These two are the two targets. I think Kapol Kursam can answer better, but he is not in the audience. But ASWR cannot be treated as a small modular reactor. It is a small and medium reactor. SMR means not small modular reactor. SMR, sorry, SMR means small <coughs> modular reactor. Not small, that's what I said. PS regular 220 is not an SMR. Why? It is not a modular reactor. There are hundreds, thousands of kilometers long pipe. I have to weld join here, there. So many valves have to. It is not factory built reactor. SMR, what people are talking about? Is a factory assembled reactor. When you buy a refrigerator from your from the market, just put on the power supply. That then only it can uh, deploy faster. ASWR was having while the good merits of passive circuit systems, but it has several kilometer long pipelines. So under the SMR category, it doesn't. Fit. That is one problem. Second problem is heavy water presence. It also holds heavy water, which also contaminates. And we are going to talk about deployment of these reactors in public domain. That's what I again and again I am saying. It doesn't have, imagine, it may not have even an exclusion zone also. Except for the minimum radius required for security aspects of this reactor. Nothing probably is possible to put in a public domain. So that is why ASWR probably it can be re-engineered to make a, a, a SMR, but putting again the heavy water, I think this is also a question that numbers which we are talking about 200 plus gigawatt, this is only, I am not talking about one or two reactors, this one. CLWR unfortunately I don't, didn't have access to that design because it was very, uh, I think, uh, isolated group was working. But let's look at what other people are doing globally. It's not that CLWR was only India was doing. CLWR was doing by almost all Western countries who holds today the nuclear submarines. It was done by Russia, done by America, done by French, done by, I don't know, these three countries that I know, they all own. I talked to the French people this time. 
They say they have all varieties of the SMRs which we are talking about. These technologies they have engineered over the years. But why they wait for this type of integral SMR, which they have also a baby in a uh, submarine?